today it's my uh, great pleasure to welcome uh, Joao uh, George. So it's uh, CIBM uh, alumni. He did uh, his PhD with uh, Rolf Grutter at uh, CIBM uh, EPFL. And uh, his main uh, research interest is uh, uh, fMRI at uh, 7 Tesla and simultaneous uh, EEG fMRI at 7 Tesla. So we had uh, the opportunity to do some recording together a few years ago. And he's still uh, active in the field, but uh, in Bern. So we would be uh, happy today to, to have more information about uh, some millimeter uh, uh, fMRI and EEG fMRI. So thank you for uh, to be here and to accept it to be the first uh, speaker of this uh, seminar. Uh, so it's also a very big pleasure uh, to be here and thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm happy to be the first of this uh, series. I hope it goes very well um, for the future. I think it's a great idea. Um, it could, could lead to, to a lot of interesting discussions and, and collaborations. Um, and so I'll be talking to you a little bit about what we've been doing on high resolution MRI. So not just fMRI, I'll, I'll do a little bit of structural as well. Uh, and the combination with, with EEG. Uh, and indeed, as, as uh, Fred just mentioned, uh, most of this work has been done in Bern, where they have a 70 tera, much like yours here. And we've been seeing that the portability is indeed, as promised, uh, pretty good. Um, although now you've, you've had a little increment with the upgrades. So uh, uh, everything I've shown, I will show here, is actually uh, on a pre-upgrade uh, machine. So just to, to make that little caveat. Uh, and so for those who don't know me so well, uh, this is just um, a little overview of the type of things I do, but Fred already introduced it very well. Uh, it's perhaps more the, um, the ones on the bottom that um, people are less familiar with. Uh, but so yes, I work mostly on brain imaging, mostly at 7T, um, more on the method side, so improving methodologies. Um, I'm a research fellow at the Swiss Center for Electronics and Microtechnology, or XAM, uh, doing my um, uh, SNF Ambitione. Uh, and I also have guest affiliations with uh, MIAL, so part of CIBM at the SHUV, um, with Mary, who, who supervises our student, um, and with neuroradiology at the Insel Spital, so next to this 70 in Bern. Um, with CSM, I also am closely involved in uh, some neurotechnologies that they have more um, history on development, especially compact and wearable um, EG devices, like I'm showing here uh, on the bottom, a device for sleep monitoring. It's very compact, easy to use devices, uh, and one that's integrated in high glasses for more daily uh, long-term measurements. I know the style of glasses, glasses is, is um, questionable, questionable, but that's stuff. not the hard part to that. Um, but I will be focusing here, uh, indeed, more on the, on the 70 uh, imaging part. Um, and so this is, before going into more functional uh, work, this is just to promote a little bit this tool we've developed. So if you work on imaging methods, especially high resolution, uh, could be functional, could be structural, um, could be acquisition, could be reconstruction, if you're looking for a good uh, computational phantom to help develop your methods, or test them or fine tune them. I would um, uh, suggest having a look at this. So it's, it's, um, it's a digital phantom that we've made, uh, which contains many of the properties that we usually need to consider. So uh, T1 relaxations, uh, susceptibility, background fields for B0, uh, coil sensitivity maps, and so on. So with this, you can simulate many, many situations of acquisition and reconstruction. And there's extensive work on block simulations and so on. So um, predicting how your signal will evolve um, based on local conditions like B0 and B1. But with this, you can sort of extend that and actually give a spatial distribution to these behaviors. So you can see what happens when you try to get an image of the brain, just to make a little advertisement on that. This is uh, the way we build it. So it's it's got... Uh, the resolution can go down to 100 micrometers. The way we build it is by bringing real in vivo data from more coarse uh, resolutions, but at 70. Um, mapping it uh, with the framework we developed uh, to this public data set of Big Brain, which is a histological uh, data set. So it's not MR, but it's very high resolution down to 100 microns and even more. Um, 
and 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 so we map the the realistic MR properties into this fine anatomy. So it would allow you to, if you really want to go down to that resolution, you can then it can be useful for methods such as super resolution, where we, where you want to model simulate uh, subvoxel effects. So super resolution applications, partial volume applications, and so on. And this is just uh, to illustrate an example of how it can be used. Uh, so here I'm showing um, um, this would be a developing uh, reconstruction methods for accelerated data. In this example, it's a uh, IP undersampling of three by three, reconstructed with SANS and wavelet transforms. So it's really just a very specific example. And here you can see real in vivo data that we uh, undersampled retrospectively. Uh, and here, uh, big brain. And you can see the effects. So in each row, you're seeing the effect of different uh, regularization weights. So you can see how noise gets suppressed, but eventually the sharpness of, of the real anatomical details also gets suppressed. And what we see is just also just to illustrate is that um, big brain. So here I'm showing a plot of the optimal regularization weight for different acceleration factors and different acceleration schemes. Uh, and you can see uh, that big brain tends to, um, so that's in light blue, tends to um, um, be much closer to an in vivo uh, example than something like a Shep Logan. So just to um, 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 show a little bit uh, why, why it benefits from being more realistic. And, and, and so this is all publicly available, uh, this data set on Zenodo. Now, moving on to uh, uh, more real brains. Um, uh, this is uh, a data set that I would also like to promote a little bit, and that will allow me to make a segue into more functional uh, work. So this is a data set we've been acquiring in Bern at 7T, uh, where we've, um, th the idea was to capture a lot of different imaging modalities, structural imaging modalities from the same individual brains, so the same anatomical uh, specific variability. Uh, and so it's not a very large data set or not a very large group, but with a lot of data per, per subject. Uh, and here you can see uh, several of these different contrasts, some of them very favorable at 7T, like different T1 weightings uh, and susceptibility. Um, we're here on the right side. Our main aim for this was to image the thalamic nuclei. So the thalamus is uh, sitting in the middle of the brain and um, it's composed of different nuclei, but they are usually very difficult to uh, distinguish with normal contrast. Uh, but my other point here is that this data set is whole brain. So if you are interested in a specific brain region that uh, is proving challenging to, to image, uh, if you've seen some papers proposing some specific contrasts that you think would be useful, uh, we are happy to um, discuss and we could go through these, these images and see if some of these contrasts could be useful for you. Um, showing here, so not just the thalamus, but for example, a uh, very nice uh, increase in contrast here with the optimized T1-weighted modality for uh, structures in the brain stem and the ponds, uh, as you can see. Just an example. So if, if you're looking for something for a specific region, we're happy to um, discuss and flip a little bit through these images. Um, but for the thalamus, indeed, we found some um, focused, what we call focused contrasts. Uh, and this is work uh, done in collaboration with uh, Tom was there as well. I saw him and the Mountaineer friends, uh, Maddie and uh, Constantin from the Shuv uh, and Joseph from, from the Netherlands. Uh, we found some um, better modalities to look at the thalamic nuclei. So you can see uh, an optimized version of T1 weighted and QSM where you can start to see these nuclei inside the thalamus where in conventional contrasts, as you can see, uh, there's not much. Um, this is just some ideas of where the contrast might come from, probably T1 coming from um, myelin, so comparing to uh, data from histology uh, from the literature, and QSM more dominated by iron, probably, just to put that caveat. Uh, but now we, we, we've been going more into function uh, on this topic. Uh, and here, uh, the interesting um, present uh, view is that, uh, in fact, there are some discrepancies seen between um, so in the thalamus between uh, what structure shows us in terms of organization of the thalamus, uh, what DTI shows us, and what fMRI shows us. And this is one of few studies that have actually uh, collected this from the same groups of subjects, 
but still making this, um, uh, including some analysis, some some steps in their uh, method to, to create these parcellations that depended on group level information. Uh, and we think that may be where the, some of these discrepancies come from. As you can see, if you look at fMRI, if the fMRI parcellation, for example, it really does not look like what we would have expected from histology, from the anatomy. And so we thought we were at a good position to look into this uh, simply by extending this uh, data set uh, that we've been doing uh, on structure uh, with fMRI, so on the same subjects. Uh, and so this is data we got, uh, 15 minutes of fMRI, watching a, um, a video from the Human Connectome Project. So these are um, uh, videos that are well documented. Uh, and we went for a protocol that is not particularly high resolution, but it's a pretty good trade-off between uh, spatial and temporal resolution, a whole brain, very robust in terms of uh, reconstruction artifacts, or I mean, very little of them. Uh, and it's uh, pretty, pretty close to what was proposed for the Human Connectome Project for the, for the 70 uh, data they have there. Uh, and so what we do, um, it's whole brain, um, and we do the usual pre-processing, motion correction, brain extraction, and so on. And then we uh, have two approaches to essentially try to extract functional clusters in the thalamus, so essentially regions that are fluctuating, co-fluctuating uh, in the same way. Um, and so one is based on just independent component analysis of the um, of the of, uh, regions just in the thalamus, so a mask on the thalamus. The other is by looking at the cortex, looking at a parcellation of the cortex, uh, which is this one from uh, Thomas Yeo. It's a very famous parcellation um, which divides the cortex into functional networks. It's based on clustering from fMRI, and we just look at which regions of the thalamus best correlate with the average time course in each of these uh, functional uh, regions. And then we compare it with the pretty good anatomical contrast that we have for the exact same subject, the exact same anatomy, without making any group um, steps. Um, this is just one, uh, one thing we looked at first, was whether the paradigm actually created distinguishable activity between these different cortical networks, because if it doesn't, then the maps you'd get in the thalamus would be the same. So if, if, if these cortical networks have similar fluctuations, then the correlation maps in another region will be similar. Uh, one interesting finding is that the, the video creates a pretty robust uh, connectivity pattern, as you can see, in three of these four subjects. So except for the subject three, which is very widely correlated, uh, the other ones create a very characteristic and pretty robust uh, connectivity structure, which is nice. So it's, it speaks for um, uh, reproducibility. Um, but at the same time, it does uh, introduce some correlations between these networks, um, which impose difficulties on what will be able to be distinguished uh, uh, in the thalamus. So we're considering potentially um, expanding the data set, perhaps with more subjects and um, other videos as well, or other paradigms to try to uh, uh, differentiate this a little bit more. But then uh, this is the type of thing we do. So we look at, uh, so each row you see is for one of these cortical networks. And then we are showing the slice in the thalamus that has the strongest um, correlation uh, to that network. So you see, for example, um, Ventral to the ventral attention network, uh, for example. So that would be the uh, violet um, uh, region in the cortex. Um, and we see a very good correlation, for example, with medial dorsal uh, nuclei, which also aligns very well with the structural organization of that subject and the atlas as well. The more interesting uh, observations are cases where we deviate from the atlas, for example, in this case for dorsal attention. We also have a medial strong correlation that aligns with expectations from the atlas. But look here, for example, these hotspots in uh, the pulvinar, which do not really um, show the same organization as the pulvinar as depicted by the atlas, but which co-localize really well with hyperintensities in QSM. So showing that it deviates from what we'd expect from the atlas organization, but it still remains very consistent for that individual's uh, structure. Uh, and of course, we also have cases where uh, everything deviates, for example, here, the Foltman network. But um, 
we will need to uh, gather a bit more subjects and try to organize this um, more consistently. So these are really, really fresh first uh, observations, but I think it speaks to another value, I think, uh, for 7T, which is not necessarily using the high functional sensitivity to go uh, very high resolution to distinguish activity uh, in very small regions, but simply to use that sensitivity to keep more analyses at the subject level. So be able to take more reliable conclusions from each single subject, each single session, uh, and in that way, avoid uh, these potential uh, confounds from anatomical variability, from uh, misalignments between subjects, uh, which occur when we need to go to group level to get more sensitivity, uh, and which ultimately, I think, uh, can compromise uh, these conclusions. And I think that thalamus and the thalamic nuclei are a really good example of that because they're so small and with a pretty complicated um, uh, organization. So uh, I think it's a very good um, example of that. Now, uh, moving to the uh, combination uh, with EEG. Uh, so most of you uh, already know this, this complementarity between uh, fMRI and EEG, so uh, several aspects. So the higher spatial specificity of fMRI combines well with a more coarse uh, resolution of EEG, and vice versa, the high temporal specificity of EEG with a more poor temporal resolution of fMRI. The substrates that they measure are also quite complementary. So EEG closer to the actual um, neuronal interactions, the, the electrical fields that, that uh, arise from that. Uh, fMRI tracking more the vascular and the uh, uh, metabolic uh, changes that come from that. Um, now the question, so building this question, uh, it makes sense to combine them, but why do that simultaneously? Well, we need to do that simultaneously uh, when we are trying to capture activity that we cannot reliably um, elicit uh, across different sessions. Uh, so that would be uh, cases of epilepsy, other pathologies, resting state, which is so widely studied, uh, variability across, across trials, and things like sleep. Uh, I guess it's a different type of resting state. Um, and avoiding effects like training or habituation between sessions, which could be really important on some, some applications. Um, now, keep building the question, why do this at 7T? Well, the reason is probably also very familiar to you. So it's the higher sensitivity, the much higher sensitivity that we get uh, for bold based fMRI and uh, the ability to trade that then for either temporal or spatial specificity. And very hot topics right now, uh, looking at not just laminar activity, but people are starting to look at laminar connectivity. So across different layers and between different cortical regions. Uh, sleep also, uh, there was this really interesting uh, publication in Science um, showing that um, with uh, EG and fMRI in sleep, uh, we, they actually could track as well the flow of CSF uh, near the fourth ventricle, which is a proxy for mechanisms of waste, waste clearance uh, in the brain, uh, also ties to this lymphatic system that is now very, very widely interested. And where they sh sh uh, saw that um, in deep sleep, uh, this um, there was a correlation between the presence of uh, delta waves in EG and waves in the CSF. So a very uh, novel um, finding with EG fMRI. And to me also, um, seeing Christophe here, um, perhaps the first example where fMRI really gives something that is not uh, reflected on EEG, but something really novel that adds to it, uh, whereas often fMRI is sort of measuring a less direct proxy of uh, neuronal activity uh, than EEG. Uh, now, why not do this? Uh, the reason is, maybe some of you already know as well, there are strong interferences between uh, EEG and MRI um, that cause artifacts on both, on both sides. Um, without going into those details, but we need to pay attention to safety aspects of induced currents in these wires that could um, pass to the subject, create heating, and then artifacts on both sides. Uh, and historically, the, the biggest bottom, and yeah, all of this gets worse at higher field strengths, so particularly problematic at 70. Um, historically, it was the EG artifacts that were the biggest bottlenecks, so that's where we worked more extensively. And yeah, I started working at uh, that during my PhD, and uh, with many of these um, uh, friends from CIBM, so Frederic as well, 
uh, Christoph, um, Rolf, um, some other colleagues, um, Litzke and, and Oslam, uh, and the industry as well. So Robert Sturmer is from uh, Brain Products, so a, a company uh, making EG systems for, for fMRI. Um, and so these are, I would say, the two main ingredients that we worked on and that I think uh, made comprised big steps towards making EEG um, of sufficient quality uh, to be done uh, with fMRI at 7T. So the use of more compact EEG setups, which are less exposed to um, induction from, from the MRI fields, and the use of reference sensors that are acquired together with the EEG, but measure only artifacts. And with those, you can try to model the artifacts on the EEG signals and clean up your responses, such as this one example here, you see a visual evoked potential um, cleaned up with this method uh, compared to uh, if you did not have it. Um, and these concepts are now uh, integrated into commercial systems, so it's very happy to see that. We are not the only ones pushing for this, possibly the main ones pushing for this at 70, um, but, but they're now uh, uh, in, in ready-to-use solutions, so, so People can use it more widely without having to customize hardware um, or algorithms. Um, with that done, we've now been focusing more on the MRI side. Uh, so we, we got the luxury to, to, to do that. Uh, and one main limitation was that we were forced to use uh, less optimal uh, RF coils that had to be open uh, on the top, so less uh, close to the head uh, to allow the EG wiring uh, to pass. Uh, and that, that gave us compromises in what we could achieve in terms of image quality compared to what is sort of state of the art right now um, with, with the Nova 32 channel uh, coils, such as you have in the terrace. Uh, they're shipped with all, all the terrace now. Uh, and the problem with that, yeah, the, these coils perform much better, but indeed there's almost no space for um, EG to pass. Uh, but there have been some works showing that there are some modifications of the EEG caps that allow us to actually work with this. There were some openings in the coil that I didn't even know were there, um, but these guys identified it, so, so that was very uh, convenient. And we've been working on similar modifications uh, in-house over the past one or two years um, to test this more extensively. And indeed, we found uh, pretty large gains in SNR. Um, uh, with uh, with these new coils and and indeed uh, setups that are compatible now with with all the new generation of terrace. Um, we've we've been doing a more extensive human data set now with this, looking really at safety aspects, EG quality, uh, MRI quality as well. Um, what we had seen before um, was that there was quite some degradation of the MRI images when the EG uh, is there. And in some regions, we had pretty, pretty severe, uh, sorry, uh, drop-offs. Uh, we don't actually see that now with these new setups, which was uh, somewhat unexpected, very, very uh, pleasing. Um, and we've seen that it's possible to go submillimeter with this. Um, it's feasible, it's safe. Um, and there are some penalties in, in image quality, but there aren't any really heavy drop-offs in the images. So you can see here, comparison between uh, an image without the EEG in place and with the EEG uh, in place. Uh, we've now been trying to quantify this better, especially the aspect of the MRI quality, because that's the big advance here. Um, and so what we've done, we look at specific regions of the brain and compare the quality and the functional sensitivity with and without uh, the EEG. For that, we need to bring some sort of standard parcellations um, to the uh, native space of MRI and the fMRI. So we need to deal with things like segmentation of the cortex uh, and the correction, especially of EPI distortions. That's something I go, I'll go more specifically into um, shortly. I will go a little bit faster on these, uh, on these slides to keep with time. Uh, the idea here is, is just a comparison of the case of no EG, the case of with EG, when we keep the same transmit voltage that the scanner had calibrated for uh, the case without cap, or uh, in blue, when we let the scanner adjust the transmit voltage, because it will receive less, um, the, the B1 is, is disturbed, these RF pulses, and so the scanner will try to compensate for this by using more, more uh, voltage on, on, on its pulses. Uh, as a result, you also get a little bit of increase in SAR. 
Um, and so here are the effects of that for different uh, cortical lobes, deep regions, white matter, uh, and the whole brain. And what we see indeed is there's usually a penalty uh, in B1 plus, uh, which gets only partially recovered by an adaptive calibration uh, scanner. Uh, but about, um, I think this one is at about 15% uh, across the whole brain uh, of penalty. Uh, B0, not really, sorry, that's on the right. B0 uh, homogeneity does not seem to be particularly affected um, by this. Um, this is the impact on a GRE uh, structural image. Uh, here, I just want to point that, yes, there's a penalty in signal amplitude, but there is also a reduction in uh, noise, in background noise. So when you get the SNR, which is the ratio of that, uh, the loss in SNR is actually a little, a little bit more moderate than the uh, loss in intensity. Uh, then we looked at fMRI. We looked at spatial SNR, temporal SNR in the uh, white matter. Um, and that shows some decreases as well, usually um, not, not more than 20% uh, across the brain, uh, except for perhaps uh, occipital and parietal regions when we go to submillimeter resolution. So that does seem to be some difference uh, between, the, between the protocols uh, and the resolutions, but they also have differences in acceleration and so on. So um, there's many factors competing uh, for this. Uh, then we looked at uh, measures that are more um, related to functional sensitivity itself. So um, this is the uh, fraction of uh, fractional amplitude of low frequency fluctuations, which is sort of a measure of the ratio of true bold activity in a region uh, compared to the full um, uh, power of the spectrum. So noise and so on. Um, it, it, here, it doesn't seem to be actually any effect having the EG in there. Um, and the same for uh, what I call functional connectivity strength, but I think technically it's not really that. So it's just the average connect, uh, correlation between time courses in each of these uh, networks, uh, the yellow uh, networks. Um, and so if you have good functional sensitivity, in principle, you should have higher uh, average within region connectivity. Uh, but it doesn't seem to be affected by, um, by the presence of EG. So it's good. It's a good uh, finding. This is just a, a, um, a very quick result. That's where we're less advanced uh, still on the EEG denoising, just showing different steps of different corrections. So for the gradient artifacts, the cardiac artifacts, and uh, then reference sensor-based uh, corrections. And the blue is the, uh, it's, uh, the spectrum in one EEG channel and how it gets closer and closer to the orange baseline, which is the spectrum for that individual outside the scanner. So, uh, from this point of view, uh, it, it seems to become pretty much comparable to the quality you get outside the scanner. But we're going to look at um, aspects more related to, to function as well to see if that is preserved as well. We are also testing now with a commercial prototype from uh, Brain Products. Uh, I think you guys got one as well uh, for 32 channels. Uh, so we're looking at uh, essentially the same things, but for this uh, upcoming commercial prototype, um, I, I think uh, it looks promising. It, it looks like it's very usable. Uh, the penalties seem to be very comparable to ours. I was a little bit disappointed on that because uh, they've made some modifications that I thought were going to uh, help with this. So it kind of uh, made a hole, uh, punched the hole in my hypothesis as well, but uh, we'll have to adapt. Um, but yes, very comparable performance. And I think this will really unlock the possibility of many more groups to, to use this um, at 70. Uh, these are just essentially the conclusions. I just wanted to go into a few insights. Let's say I try to stick to five minutes for this or less um, of what we learned using uh, SMS CPI at the Terra. Uh, so relatively easy to get protocols down to 0 0.8 millimeter as a tropic. Um, if you want to do whole brain, you pay with a longer TR, but that's trade off we have to do. Uh, but you can also focus on certain regions and then have a, a shorter TR as well. Um, we've tested this 0 0.8 protocol in uh, Bern and in Geneva, so with uh, a project with Petra, uh, both before and after your upgrade, and there were no issues porting the protocol. Uh, there were some performance differences, sorry, just to mention, but I'll get to that. Uh, soon. Um, one thing, just some things I, I would just raise your attention to when you're setting up 
um, an fMRI protocol, especially at this resolution. You can expect heavy distortions uh, at the front and in the temporal lobes because they're near cavities. Um, and the choice of the direction of the phase encoding will determine uh, the direction of those distortions in regions where the B0 is indeed uh, more disturbed. So depending on the brain region that you're most interested in, you may want to, to try both and, and see what's most suitable for you. For example, here I'm showing the um, tip of the temporal lobe, and you can see the distortion is reversed on both. And perhaps an A2P would be best for you if you're really interested in temporal lobe. Uh, conversely, if you're interested in the frontal uh, part more, um, then perhaps P2A would be best because then it gets stretched while in A to P it gets compressed. Uh, some people have proposed to just, if you can afford to split your um, session or your runs in two, to do both one with one direction and the other with the reverse direction. But if you're really interested in a specific region, it might be worth to have a look first and then, and then decide. Uh, another aspect that um, we found is that sometimes these protocols are not very stable in time, so you get increased uh, ghosting over time. This is after five minutes of acquisition in this particular subject in burn. Uh, the good news for you is that um, I think there's much less of these effects for the same protocol here, and especially after the, um, after the upgrade, we did this 20 minutes, 15 minutes run. I think, um, and, and there was very little uh, ghosting uh, at the end. So, um, it, but still something to keep in mind when setting up a pro protocol, it may look very good on the first volumes, you acquire maybe five volumes or so, uh, but really test your protocol to the length that you need. Uh, and hope uh, ideally in a f more than a few, more than one subject to, to be sure that it's, it's stable across time. Because these ghosts, it can really, in some subjects, it can really uh, um, increase a lot over time. Um, just some aspects about this, uh, this step that we do so often. So uh, cortical segmentation, which is essential for, for layer fMRI, uh, or for bringing parcels, parcellations from standard space uh, into the native space, and the distortion correction for API. Um, Cortical segmentation, we found that uh, often the, so the FreeSurfer works pretty well with uh, the MP2H kind of acquisition, meaning uh, it, it does not crash often, um, but it does have some limitations. For example, as you see here, the Dura uh, has been uh, included as part of the, of the gray matter on, on several parts. Um, here you can see another example of that as well. And then if you look at activity across these layers, uh, your results are going to be heavily skewed. So it's really important to, to watch out for that. We found that you can actually uh, do the brain masking beforehand and FreeSurfer will deal with that. Even though it tries to do its own masking, it still deals well with uh, being supplied with data that's already brain masked. So you can split your problem and then focus on a good masking. The better your masking before going into FreeSurfer, the better uh, or the less uh, these uh, mistakes will appear. Uh, another thing we found is that even though the MP2 rage is uh, robust against B1 in homogeneities, we still, on single transmit at least, um, we still find, uh, for example, the temporal lobes uh, having a, a lower, uh, poorer intensity and contrast uh, compared to other regions of the brain. And the consequence, you have, uh, yeah, I, I think you can see well, right? So the consequence is that FreeSurfer tends to underestimate uh, the extension of the gray and white matter because of that. So we found that adding also a prior step of field compensation, for example, with FSL fast. Uh, will fix this uh, uh, to some extent and, and allow better results afterwards. So it's a pretty quick, straightforward step you can do beforehand, and it will help FreeSurfer uh, afterwards. Distortion correction, um, we found uh, a pretty good uh, uh, results using top-up from FSL as well. So you acquire um, your data and you acquire some reference volumes in the opposite phase encoding direction. And we found best performance using, uh, in fact, a spin echo API version of the gradient echo that, you've, um, that you're using for fMRI. Uh, this is already relatively well known also for other fields. Uh, the good surprise was that the um, default sequence you have for spin echo API on the Terra works pretty well and you can match very well um, the distortions and, and the encoding uh, that is done with, with the SMS gradient echo API. 
and just cycling between the two so you can see. And then you acquire uh, the two versions of that. So reverse phase encodings, you can see the distortions get um, reversed. Uh, and with that, you can estimate these warping parameters. And that this seems to be the approach that gives the best uh, results so far. But we haven't tried other methods besides. Uh, and so I'll conclude now just to thank our supporting uh, institutions, all these collaborators that we've been working with uh, recently. And um, yeah, you for your attention. And uh, happy to discuss any questions. If you have any suggestions, especially for the free surfer part, um, we, we're happy to, uh, to hear uh, as well. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Joao. So I'm sure there will be a, a lot of questions. So if you have a question in the room or uh, online, you can uh, raise your hand. Maybe we can start in the room if there is some question. I have a I have a question. Sorry. <clears throat> yes. Um. So you mentioned the um, the quality of the MRI data when you combine with EEG. What about the quality of the EEG data? How how comparable is it uh, inside and outside the the MRI? And does seventy versus three T creates uh, um, additional artifacts or lesser quality for the EEG, or is it comparable? Yeah, so um, yeah, I went very, very briefly uh, into the EEG part because it's, um, as I mentioned, the, little, the, the part that we have less advanced uh, in the data analysis. Uh, this was the only um, um, image I had to show you uh, for that. So it, it seems with the techniques that we've been applying that we had been developing over the years, it seems we can get uh, the EG uh, quality to a comparable quality to what you'd get outside the scanner. So for, for each subject, we're getting a little bit of EG before they go in the scanner. So just on the room outside after we prepare, uh, and then we're getting uh, EG inside as well with and without fMRI um, uh, to, to compare. Um, and so from a perspective of uh, the spectrum, the spectral profile and, and the power, it seems we can get uh, pretty close to um, uh, the profile that you'd get outside the scanner. The question we need to address and haven't yet is whether we preserve um, the features of interest. Um, so uh, it seems we can uh, mitigate, uh, reduce variability down to, to a good extent. The question is if we're not throwing up uh, uh, too much of, of activity of interest. But yes, this is something we, we expect to have a lot more uh, uh, insights on uh, very soon. Thanks, Thanks for your question, Ali. Yeah, we have another question from uh, Virginie on online. Yes, thank you for your talk. Uh, my question was in fact related. What is which pipe, pipeline do you use to clean the EEG signal? Do you use the one from BrainApp or do you have your own? No, exactly. We have our own. Uh, over the years, we've been uh, um, um, developing and optimizing uh, uh, and improving on this. Um, so we're quite happy with this, uh, with our own uh, pipeline for this. It also depends on the data we have, like uh, for this data set, for example, because I have, um, we have data from outside the scanner, inside the scanner without the fMRI going on. We have a lot of sort of reference baseline uh, uh, recordings from the same subjects to which we can compare uh, to look at the, the performance on each step of, of correction. So it, it's a lot more um, powerful for us to use uh, our own pipelines. But I'm happy to share and, and, and discuss uh, those possibilities. Yeah. There are um, uh, commercial alternatives for all these steps, including the, the one based on reference sensors. Um, I cannot speak for, for um, I haven't really made a objective benchmarking against them. It's just for convenience and because we're we feel pretty comfortable with with our um with our methods we've been, we've been using those yeah we can discuss after thanks question from uh, christophe thank you Rose. that's very very interesting of the developments you might 
uh, I was uh, particularly interested in the distortion in the in the frontal prefrontal lobe and mm -hmm. the temporal lobe. I remember when you did the study with with Lucy at the seventy in, in the CBM, you simply said, "Sorry, we have no signal there." <laughs> did, did, this, did this change now because of the new machines or because of things that you developed that made it better? Uh, so actually, um, these distortions and dropouts are because of B0 effects. And B0, I think, is the aspect that has least changed since the scanner in Lausanne and so on. There have been improvements on the B1 side, so the efficiency of excitation and so on. But the distortions and dropouts, um, I don't think they're much better than they would have been. The important point to keep in mind is um, as the gradients get better, so I think the gradients are better now with, with, the, with the upgrade. Um, you, it's true, you can reduce a little bit the distortions by uh, encoding faster um, uh, with having better gradients. Um, what I do think still makes the most difference is choosing the right, uh, so this was this aspect that I was uh, mentioning here, choosing the right um, encoding direction. It's, that's a bit either or, either temporal lobe or frontal lobe. That's a bit, yeah. <laughs> or then you do it twice. So that is... Exactly. Uh, so if you can afford to either repeat the run or split it in two, you could do both. Uh... And, and the very last image you showed where you swapped between two things. Uh, last slide where you swapped between two. Ah, yes. That, that looked to me very interesting. Because the frontal part is coming, no? I mean, this is a big correction, no? So, uh, so that's exactly the effect of the distortion for this, uh, for this region and for this encoding bandwidth, essentially it's a bandwidth and phase encoding that, that determines that. Uh, just to mention that this is Pinaco API, so it's more good looking than uh, the gradient echo API that we usually use for ephemera. Um, but yes, I, I think this gives a good idea of the, of the effect. Also to mention, this is the, the 0 0.8 protocol. That one has larger distortions because the encoding train is longer as well. We have a, we have a, a lower bandwidth um, in the phase encoding direction. So, so this will have, this is probably the worst, I guess, the worst case you could, you could see. Um, because because uh, uh, we're doing a whole brain, uh, um, so we're, we're shimming for the whole brain. If we do, if we focus on the frontal, so we could choose, I would choose this, um, this direction of encoding because uh, I think a stretch is easier to deal with in post-processing than a compression. Compression, you, you get, you collapse information into voxels. Um, but uh, this, this is whole brain and shimmed for the whole brain. If you'd focus on, on the frontal cortex, you could improve the shimming a little bit, hopefully, a little bit. Uh, so get less, less distortions. We have a last question from Roberto. We're talking that you have some penalties in uh, B1 efficiency. Uh, do you see any difference in B1 homogeneity? In the which homogeneity? B1? B1 homogeneity, B1 plus. Uh, yeah, I, I don't recall if I. Yes, there is a there's a little increase in uh, homo in homogeneity heterogeneity, <laughs> as well. I don't recall if I had um if I had that in my plots or not, but it's something we've. No, I don't know. Really. Here I just have the average. I have the uh, for B zero. Uh, we we are doing the full width at alpha maximum of B zero in that region which is a, a, an indication of how much it varies there, so heterogeneity. And we did the same for B1, and it does tend to increase a little bit, yes. Uh, I'm just going to check if I... No, I don't have, I don't have the plots here. Um, but yes, there's a little bit more. So I think, I guess it's a relatively low-hanging fruit that PTX might help with this, with all of this. Um, of course, with the potential safety questions that need to be further addressed, but at least getting it to a C marked status is, is very good. It will not fully solve the problem because the disruption is on both ways. So it's the transmit field and the receive field. Uh, meaning, yeah, if you try to improve the first and partially recover, hopefully, yeah. 
some of this some of this penalty. Olivier, you have a, another question? Uh, yes, if there's time, because I know that uh, that Joao is also a specialist on um, physiological noise on MRI data. And so si since you've shown that you can actually get quite good MRI data you, um, despite the EEG, could we actually even go further in theory and use the EEG to clean up the MRI data with all those probes, uh, capture some information either about noise, physiology, or kind of as a mini scope. I don't know if there's a, is this a possibility in the future? Um, some groups have looked at um, using the um, induction effects on the EEG for a sort of higher resolution or higher temporal resolution um, indication of motion of the head. And it's also sensitive to this very tiny motion that you get, this uh, little bump you get when uh, uh, the heart pumps blood towards the head. So um, that would also potentially be interesting uh, to explore. Although, yeah, the people have worked on methods to, to look for those things on their own independently with, with high precision cameras and so on. So, um, yeah, the, the, there's there's some things that can be explored and have been explored, um, but it, it may still be most effective to use dedicated methods uh, for this. I did not mention, but we did record the uh, um, pulse and respiration from from these same subjects from this data set. One thing we'll be looking at is also because you mentioned physiological noise is how um, the ratio between thermal and uh, non-thermal physiological noise is affected. Uh, by EG as well uh, for these different protocols. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Joao, for this presentation. Thank you.